You're listening to The World at Eight with Lynn Mozart. <laughs> Nationalist News. Highlights of the news today, Friday the 7th of September. Drunken Brits lose child in Portugal. Iraqi family assassinated in France. Subhumans and humans with Nick Griffin, MEP. 31 children die trying to get into Europe via Greece. Race on for the White House. Thought for the day, Iran, what is their game? Iran and Israel, where are we heading? And finally, a bronze statue of a naked pregnant woman. UK News. A two-year-old toddler has been rescued by holidaymakers and police in Portugal after being deserted by her parents. Her British so-called parents are apparently teachers, although it's not known if they were on holiday in Portugal or working in Lisbon. The couple, aged 40 and 38, were found drunk and incapable, staggering around a bar a hundred yards away. The child was kept overnight in a rescue shelter where she was given drinks to rehydrate her and food. The unnamed toddler was reported to the authorities after a holiday maker said she heard the child crying and had to stop her running into the busy main road in the resort of Carcavelas near Lisbon. The parents will not receive the child back until the authorities have assessed the situation. A World Date reporter commented, You wouldn't find animals doing this. They fight to the death to protect their young. Not us humans. Well, certainly not when alcohol's involved. The poor old Portuguese must be sick and tired of drunken Brits losing their children. An Iraqi-born man, Saeed al-Hili, 50, his wife, Iqbal, and 77-year-old mother-in-law, on holiday in the French Alps, were killed in an attack in Annecy in the Haute-Savoy region of France. The two children who survived were at separate hospitals for their own protection. The seven-year-old daughter, Zainab, had been beaten so badly, her rescuers thought she'd been shot and was dead. Her four-year-old sister, Zena, hid under her mother's legs at the back of the British-registered BMW for eight hours until found. She was unhurt but traumatised. An unfortunate French cyclist who was thought to be a witness to these executions was shot in the head. At a news flash, Prosecutor Eric Malot said that... Prosecutor Eric... Prosecutor Eric Malot said that British police have reported that the girl's father had been feuding with his brother over money. A family friend said that the father of the two men died recently, while public records showed the brother had left the victim's small aeronautics design firm. This presenter comments, When I first heard about it, two thoughts went through my head. Firstly, that they were not an English family, and that it was a contract killing. It would appear I am right. Always trust your feelings. This is the last report from Nick Griffin MEP before he returns to the belly of the beast. I happened to see an advert for cosmetics company Revlon the other day. It reminded me of the early 1980s anti-vivisection campaign, Revlon Tortures Rabbits. That in turn got me thinking of the way in which animal rights protesters are remarkably shy when it comes to taking on the biggest single source of cruelty towards animals in Britain today, ritual slaughter. One thing led to another, and a quick internet search unearthed the lyrics of Evolution, the animal rights track by an arco-punk band the Subhumans, originally formed in 1980, rather improbably, in deepest proletarian Wiltshire. The song opens with the lines, Out in the garden there's a little white rabbit, like Revlon torture for your clean little habits. Subsequent verses bemoan the treatment for the succession of innocent animals. Out in the garden there's a little white dog, little white cat, and so on. All in all, it's not exactly Shelley or Wordsworth, but it does make rather good anti-vivisection propaganda. As an aside, I'm inclined to think that in cases of real medical need, animal experimentation may be the lesser of two evils, but I cannot see the justification for inflicting suffering on defenseless animals just so that some cosmetics company can make more money by adding an extra product to its range of needlessly created wants. Even where there is genuine medical need, I'm inclined also to think that imprisoned sex offenders and similar human scum should be used for medical tests rather than innocent and defenceless animals. But, returning to the subhumans' Wiltshire garden, I looked at lines like, Out in the garden there's a little white dog, shampoo in your eyes like a burning fog. And I thought of the animals their licensed left-wing rebellion very carefully ignores. So, being on holiday at the time, 
I scribbled down a few alternative lyrics in the same style. Out in the garden there's a little white rabbit, like Muslims torture for their strange god's habits. Out in the garden there's a little white goat, like Muslims torture when they cut its throat. And so on, with a little white cow, little white sheep, and, switching from ritual slaughter to a related, but even bigger taboo, little white child. I'll not inflict the full horror of my dog rule versification on your defenceless ears, but just in case one of the punk bands on the wilder fringes of nationalism wants to have a go at recording it, we'll publish both the original and the amended lyrics for them to see and play around with. I say play, but there is of course a serious purpose to this. Music, even if technically poor, reaches parts of the human brain and soul that words alone cannot. That's why the left and the internationalists use it so extensively and ruthlessly in their long war against identity, tradition and decency, and why it's important that young nationalists should look for ways to advance our own cause in the same way. Talking of advancing our cause, some people have asked whether our current focus on demonstrations indicates that we're giving up on elections. The answer, of course, is most definitely not. Elections remain the primary way in which shifts in public opinion are registered in nominally democratic countries, such as Britain. Even though they're heavily weighted against us by the vast amounts of money and media backing available to the establishment parties, we will most definitely continue to fight them. That said, I've been looking at UKIP's recent election results. With the growing unpopularity of the Cameron regime and the constant plugging of the BBC's pet rebel, Nigel Farage, UKIP should be riding high in the polls. But in fact, their votes are dire. In a recent by-election in the middle-class part of Stoke, for example, the UKIP vote crashed by half. Some of their other results have been even worse. This follows the pattern seen in the London elections, where our vote dropped seriously, but the UKIP vote fell even further, and the English Dems and the NS were frankly obliterated. Clearly then, this isn't about us as a party. It's about the electoral cycle, and most of all, it's about the ever-growing popular disillusionment with the entire political process which is depressing turnouts, so that the small but reliable Labour bloc postal vote of immigrants and left-wing town hall parasites does the job time after time. The few normal people who do still vote are increasingly keen to give the condemns the kicking they deserve, and unfortunately, they tend to think that voting Labour is the best way to do it. Don't worry, the cycle will turn, and more importantly, the pressure of events will sooner or later push the disillusioned silent majority from angry grumbling to even more angry action. Our time, as the slogan so aptly has it, will come. But it will come all the quicker if we up our game in terms of election preparations. A lot of our new people, naturally enough, know nothing about fighting elections properly. Too many of our established officials still think in terms of electioneering being about putting out a leaflet in the week before polling day, when in reality it's about having candidates who beaver away, helping their local community in the months and years between elections. That way, when the opposition smear them, local voters know it's all lies and turn to us in sympathy. Over the last couple of years of analysis and experiments, we've learned a lot of very valuable lessons that, properly applied by all our local officials and activists, will greatly improve our election contesting capability. So we will keep pressing ahead with the demonstrations, because with the electoral cycle in its present phase, there are better way of attracting public interest and recruiting new members than electioneering in a not particularly favourable climate. This is why we need to invest more time and money in doing demonstrations really well, looking good and hitting on issues that show the public that we're different from the old parties, that we're the ones on the side of the overtaxed, silent majority. But as we recruit new people through demonstrations, we must ensure that we introduce them to and immerse them in the principal function of a democratic political party, like the British National Party, the business of fighting elections to win. That needs time and money invested too, because winning is nine-tenths about effective preparation, and that's what we've got to be about, because we're not here just to fight, but also to win. Thank you, Nick. I concur with you on the human test subjects instead of animals. Most animals do not deserve to die, and some people do not deserve to live. World news. 
Reuters have reported that 60 people died when their overcrowded boat overturned less than 100 metres from the western Aegean coast of Turkey. Most of the victims are thought to be Palestinian and they may have been trying to enter the EU via a Greek island. 31 of the dead were children, a district official has said. This unseaworthy fishing vessel is one of the many that respond to the call from Europe's governments that their cities are paved with gold and they welcome all into their multicultural communities. A World Date reporter said, These governments are guilty of the deaths of all of these children and many more. We in the UK and the EU should closely monitor immigration from outside Europe. Prevention is better than cure. The race is on for the White House, with many Americans saying that Barack Obama's policies to get the United States on the move again have failed. Mitt Romney has promised Americans millions of new jobs and has expressed his unhappiness that under Barack Obama, 58% of American new jobs were totally underpaid. In polls, America voted 54% to 35% for the removal of the Obama government. Mitt Romney has quoted, America needs jobs, lots of jobs. Thought for the day. What is Iran and the West playing at? All the news of the Paralympics and cabinet reshuffle in the UK is taking the sheeple's minds off what is actually happening on the world stage now. Thank God Camoran has shuffled Warsi. There were many a goodly man who hoped that she had been shuffled off this mortal coil, or at least out of this country, but I fear not. The Paralympics, despite the bravery of many of our disabled serving soldiers, affects me like the Olympics next factor. I feel like I'm in the audience at the gladiatorial games where they used to have dwarves or vertically challenged people fighting battles. Now the world is heating up, and I do not just mean the ice flows in the Arctic and Antarctic, but in the Middle East, which is simmering and bubbling like a witch's brew, boil and bubble. We have seen most of the long-established leaders either killed or leaving in Iraq, Libya and Egypt. Syria is cruising for a bruising from the West and their so-called neighbours, and I fervently hope that Assad survives to fight another day. There are calls that Assad may be harbouring WMDs or chemical weapons to use on his enemies. Good for him. If I were him, they would have been used a year ago, and to very good effect. But of course, it is an excuse to invade a country now, on the say-so of united morons and the anything but democratic rebels, who simply want to install a harsh Islamic state, where there once was relative harmony, well as harmonious as any Muslim state would ever get. Benjamin, Netanyahu and the US are locked in struggles over whether to invade or bomb Iran. Netanyahu is losing patience with the West, and I can see his point. Ahmadinejad has made no secret of the fact that he would blow Israel and its Jewish occupants off the face of the earth, and lose no sleep at all. How can a country like Israel, which is surrounded on all sides and within by Arabs, survive such a threat? This threat is open and be ignored by the West, much as the Muslim grooming is ignored in the UK. It's accepted rather than ignored. Now, I would rather have a Jewish neighbour than an Arab or a Muslim neighbour. Preferably, though I would rather have no neighbours at all within his sight or earshot, but then that's me. I understand that the huge corporations in the West that would gain tremendous amounts of money from that war that could follow on from either the blasting of Israel or the bombing of Iran, but fail to understand how they would live to enjoy such fruits, as the world would be a very different place after such a fight. Apart from conspiracy theories, and there is no smoke without fire, we can have several outcomes here. Without going all son of God David Icke, we as nationalists can understand that you can have great ideas and theories, but they can be ruined by just a few oddball or extreme sentences, as with Icke and his lizard people, and us with rampant extremism. But another theory is that this is all planned, an almost total wipeout of world population and a new start, with either aliens who have been here thousands of years, or, of course, the lizard people, who are also well ensconced, according to David. We also have the messianic theory that the Antichrist is here and will rule. Well, actually, two points on this one. First, he loses. And secondly, they would have to use neutron bombs because the nuclear ones are bigger and dirtier than the ones used on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. For those who do not know, the N-bomb kills people and animals and leaves buildings intact, with very little radioactivity. Absolutely perfect. The other theory is that with the Middle East gone, the Muslims would have cause to invade Europe even more so than they have done now, and we would have a totalitarian Islamic state called Arabia. Yet another scenario is that the Chinese would start walking, and that Europe would need the Muslims to fight off the Chinese. 
Of course, it could be, according to the Illuminati, that it is the Chinese who would inherit the earth, not the meek. As to that interpretation of the Bible and that saying of our Saviour, I believe when he said the meek shall inherit the earth, he meant the meek would inherit six feet of earth each and the strong would inherit God's kingdom means that they would inherit the earth as Jesus' kingdom when he comes again. There, so much for my religious points, but truly has anyone really thought about what could happen in our future? We could prevent Iran from bombing Israel, true, but for how long? How long before Israel's patience runs thin and they bomb Iran? How long before Syria falls to the extremists and turns Turkey even more pro-Islam than now? Turkey comes into the failing EU with even more Muslims moving into Europe. The Eurozone financial crisis collapses, causing shockwaves on the financial markets. Meanwhile, America is busy forming huge corporate armies to hold their forts, and likewise the Russians, who have China on their doorstep. And nobody anywhere really knows what the end game is. It may seem I'm depressive and I do not admire my fellow man. The opposite is true. I think these times are great and interesting. The challenges are enormous for all of us, and us nationalists more than most. The British and their European counterparts will have to stand and be counted. Once they have decided whose side they're on, they will be a fighting force to be reckoned with. These are just the times in between. We have misinformation from the media who are afraid of what we can achieve when our backs are to the wall. No man is an island, and we are all linked. But we are linked for a purpose, and that purpose is firstly our survival and the survival of our culture, our colour, and our country. That is first. But we must think and learn, as knowledge is not only power, but it is self-empowering. And finally, a bronze statue of a naked pregnant woman is to be loaned to the town of Ilfracombe in Devon. The 67-foot monstrosity has had over a hundred objections by the townsfolk. The council passed the order to bring the statue, by Damien Hurst, to Ilfracombe this summer. One person commented, it's not right that our children have to endure this at such an early age. It's an embarrassment to parents who want their children's innocence kept. This presenter says the best thing to do with Hurst and all his artwork is to put them and him in a plastic cube and bury it in a landfill site. The council concerned must be getting huge backhanders from Hearst's agents or the ugly pill manufacturers. You have been listening to The World at Eight. I am Lynn Mozart, and I and the team at World at Eight and Radio Britain wish you all a very happy and a very safe weekend. <laughs>